Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you all in one service. That's always kind of fun. So I, I need to know how many of you are normally your first service people. That's, no, I mean, you got to say something. Don't just raise your hand. We want to hear you. I mean, are you there? Okay. That's good, right? And then second service people. Wow. Wow. Bonus points for second service, I guess. Let's go. Um, I would love for you to, uh, if you could just, if there's an empty space next to you, maybe just scoot a little bit. And mainly because the 1030 service people will start coming by about 1045 if they're not here yet. So we need to have room for them when they, when they come in. Just kidding. Just kidding. But, uh, so, uh, but yeah, if you could, if there's a little bit of space, just we want to uh, have it for as people kind of trickle in. But great to be with you here this morning. My name is Ryan. It is uh, my joy to serve here as one of the pastors on staff. And uh, it's so fun for us once uh, a year when we do this Labor Day one service, it's a great time for us to kind of see people that maybe you don't see that often because we are two-service church. And uh, for those of you out on the plaza as well, it's fun to uh, have people on the plaza and online and have all of you together with us today. But we do this because we believe in the value of being a church together. And uh, we've been talking about that a lot this month. And just the, the joy of discovering life in Jesus happens in the context of community, not just individual. So we hope you enjoyed today. And the rest of today, we will have communion in, during the service, as well as we're going to end with a few baptisms. Uh, so stick around for that. And then there is a men's ministry. We have some uh, smoked pulled pork going on. Uh, so it's a free lunch for all of you afterwards. So, And yes, you do have to smell some of it right now. I can tell. So um, it's just, you know, you got to power through. But uh, we're looking forward to the whole day together with that. Um, uh, really, I just want to let you know about one thing that's coming up. Starting uh, in, can you believe it's September already? So in September, this is our month where we really are connecting and getting in groups and uh, just kind of all those next steps. So there's a few things. If you are new to Seacoast and you're looking to connect, We'd love to hear from you, and we use a, what we call our Connect card. It's a digital Connect card, or there's a paper one if you're in the room in here. You can uh, fill out that card, drop it in one of the offering uh, boxes on your way out, or uh, check, stop by our Connections table for just give us two minutes of your time. They'd love to just connect a name with a face. That's the best way to get connected. If you'd prefer to use our digital Connect card, you can scan this code, and uh, this is, again, a place where you can uh, share prayer requests, uh, where you can sign up, or just let us know you're here. And uh, we'd love to connect with you that way. Um, now, this month of September, you're going to be hearing about groups that you can connect in, life groups. And also, I want to let you know, we have a thing called Rooted, which will start towards the end of this month. And if you haven't been in a group before, and you're looking to get connected or rooted in your church, uh, your faith, and your purpose, that that will be starting in a few weeks. And so, you can use your digital connect card. It'll take you to a sign up. You can sign up for Rooted. Or if you can't find it, just write Rooted, and we'll get back to you. And so, we want you to know about that. One other thing that I want you to know about, we've been talking about, but I want to invite uh, Peter and Nadine Mers up. They're going to help us talk about it, but we uh, have a program here that we partner with um, every year around this time of year, and you're clapping for them? You can clap for them. Yeah, I mean, why not? You have no idea why you're clapping for them, but you can. It's great. Um, but we have a, part, uh, a program here where we call it, it's Host of Student, where uh, we partner with some people at University of uh, San Diego... UCSD, and uh, for international students who are flying in from overseas to begin a semester, to a whole year or whatever, um, Host Family is a program where we uh, partner up, where we get a list of names and uh, of students looking for a place for a couple days, sometimes it's two, three, sometimes a little bit longer, but usually not, and they just need someone to meet them at the airport and to help them kind of get oriented, and sometimes it's a, a, a target run and, and that kind of stuff, and then it, it becomes a great way to connect with these families as they uh, wait for their student housing. And Peter and Nadine have been a part, have hosted students for many years, and uh, so just tell us a little bit about why do you keep doing this? Uh, I didn't realize I had the gift of hospitality until I uh, got involved in this ministry. So that was kind of neat to see there's different aspects of hospitality and just being able to invite someone from another country that's new here to be able to um, uh, be with an American family, to have our children involved when they were younger, and then just to have that contact with them throughout the year. And the neat thing is we've been blessed in return. Um, our son is in the Netherlands now, and one of the 
uh, guys we hosted from the ne Netherlands, when he went back and Evan moved there, his family has taken him under their wings. So that's wow. been kind of cool to see the blessings that we didn't when we didn't plan on. Yeah. yeah, it's interesting kind of being on the other side of the equation because we've done this for many years and now having our son in the Netherlands, there's been issues where we've been able to talk to this Rene and Jose over in the Netherlands. They've been really helpful to us. So it's kind of been interesting seeing how important that is. And you put yourself in the shoes of a family that's like sending their kid over to the United States and never been here. Like, who's this family that's going to, you know, meet our, our kid at the airport and take mm -hmm. him home? And and I, the, the sad part, I guess, what I've learned from the guy who at uh, Salon Beach Prez has kind of helped run the thing is that sadly many um, students, international students, never experience being in an American home the whole time they're here. And so it's just a great, um, great fun thing to do. So. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great. So, so the hope is that as they come, we host them for a few days. They get to meet, see American life, which so, yeah. some maybe are familiar with, some completely not uh, familiar with. Yeah, and then uh, can be invited back to uh, holidays, things like that. And it's a, a way that we can be the hands and feet of Jesus. But tell us a little bit, what is it like to host a student uh, so, so that we know? And I know you have your student with us today, so <laughs> I'm not putting him on the spot. He, Peter's trying to put you on the spot, but... <laughs> What was it like to host a student? Well, I've always loved to travel, and the, the neat thing about having uh, someone from another country here is we're able to experience or get to know their country through them. And um, I'm sorry, what was the question? Uh, <laughs> I forgot. What is it like to host a student? Is that the oh, question I asked? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, what, what do you do? How's that? Oh, what yeah. Do? What does it Tell entail? Me, uh, <laughs> well, it's, it's pretty. It's, it's, so all you really do is you see so you. Um, you know, find a student on, online, says, yeah, let's, let's work with that person. They communicate with them. We pick them up from the airport. They come home. They st stay with us. Um, I think Tebow's with like four nights or whatever. Then we help, kind of help them move in their student housing, wherever that is. And maybe there's a few things they need for the room, like extra sheets or a few things, this and that. And then, then we're just kind of, you know, keep in touch with them during the year. So it's actually really easy to do. The funny part was we live in a really small house, and when our kids were young, our son would sleep on the floor in our room and then our student would be with us. But when their kids were really young, they were thrilled to have like an older person stay yeah. for another kind. Of, it was a lot of fun. So it was good for our kids to see that yeah, too. Yeah, we have, we have meals together with them and just uh, maybe take them out to the beach. Uh, they hang out with our pets. If a, lot of, a lot of them don't seem to have pets uh, that we've run into. So that's been kind of cool for them to yeah. be here. Yeah, if you want to put on the spot, but Tebow's here from Switzerland, so he was our last student, so you can say hi to him, so wave Tebow, and you can wave and say hi to him, so put him on the spot. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Well, I, I think it's great that he's here with you, I've been multiple weeks, and so that shows just that you can form a bond pretty quickly. I know for us, when uh, we have hosted students from Japan before, and watching them out on the trampoline with our kids, and Thanksgiving, when they see a real American turkey, and they're like, seriously, this is not just in the movie, you eat things this big, and... Uh, but so it's been great. So um, I guess the last thing is just what, what, why should, you know, what is for you, what is the benefit that you have received? I guess you kind of led to it a little bit, alluded to it a little bit. Just in what, what would we gain from that if we host a student? It's about giving, but we do get, receive. Uh, a friendship, right? a new friendship. We keep in touch with uh, some of our students back. Um, we had a student, I think it was our first one through the program from England, and we've kept in touch with him since... Uh, since then, which I think he was 21 or 20 at the time, now he's in his 30s, and we've been able to go back to his country and spend time with he and his family, and then we had another student from Spain that we did the same with, so that's been a real, real blessing. Um, yeah, just a long-term friendship. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. And, and maybe this is a question I didn't prep you for, but when you first hear about it, if you have not done this before, you hear it and you think, oh, this sounds intimidating, mm -hmm. difficult, I, am I going to be a good host? What, what of the things that you were afraid to do would you, did you realize, actually, that was easier than I thought? Yeah, I think so. What was the thing from last week? Was it make your move or something yeah. like that? What's yeah, your so move? what's your move? And, and was, they just would challenge everyone, just, just try it once. You know, because really, so it's like, you know, it's maybe three or four nights. You kind of stretches you a little outside your comfort zone, but it's just, it's just good. I think God wants to stretch us outside our comfort zone, and I think that's one of the benefits there. And, and so, like, when I saw that, like, what's your move? And it's just, so I just, I, if you're thinking about doing it, just, just try it once. I think you'll really be surprised. And it's fun. And uh, if you have little kids, you know, they'll be thrilled, too, to have someone stay with you guys, that, too. That's so. great. 
Well, thank you for that. So here's how it works is if you, sign, you say, hey, I'm interested, you'll receive an email that will actually give you a list of students looking for a place and it'll say what dates they need help. And that, that's what can be helpful. So sometimes um, my family, we've done it. Um, some years, unfortunately this year, most of the dates aren't matching up. I keep checking. I'll give you another that I think is a pro tip. We've hosted multiple students at the same time and sometimes from the same country. And we found it easier because then the pressure was off us to entertain and they were, they, you know, had a friend, they were able to kind of assimilate together and it's actually, uh, it was a lot of fun for our family to do it that way. So uh, you're done. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, just, you're done. That, that's one thing too, is that there's, you, you're not like the tour guys so like, you know, like with you is we pick them up from the bus station and they do a lot of things themselves. So it's not, I guess the thing, it's not hard. You don't feel like, wow, I got to, you know, be a four day full-time tour. It's not that way at all. So, right. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, well, thank you for that. Let me just, uh, let's just pray over that ministry and then uh, we'll, we'll uh, continue on. Lord God, we thank you so much for our opportunity as a church to be your hands and feet of, of Jesus and to welcome people, uh, not just uh, to a new school, but to a new country, to a new culture, and just to be able to be a, a, a source of comfort. So we thank you for all the students we get to hang out with. And I thank you for all the families and uh, for anyone who's considering this, Lord, I, I just pray that you would uh, open the doors if the doors need to be open there. We know we trust you um, to make this uh, work. So we thank you, and we give you this time in your name. Amen. And again, you can write a host family on your Connect card, or you can even find Peter and Nadine afterwards, or George and Carol are here too, and George, uh, they've been a part of it for a long time, and, uh, and so, uh, but if you just write it on the card, we'll connect you with the right people. All right, thank you. So yeah, now you can clap for them. That's right. All right, here's what I'd like you to do. We're just going to take about one minute and, and say hello to someone around you and try to find someone who attends a service that you don't usually attend, okay? You just looked at me like, whoa, what, what are you doing, right? Just say hello to each other. All right. How many of you actually did that? You actually met someone from a different service than you. Okay. Oh, good, good, good. Some of you. The rest are rebels. Well, hey, I, would, I uh, want to introduce you to someone before we continue with our service and uh, go into our scripture reading. Before we do that, I want to introduce you to uh, someone here that we just, he was just wandering through. No, I'm just kidding. So this is uh, Mikey Venable, and we, he is our new director of junior high ministries here at the church. That is me. That, that is, is me. That is me. So we, we feel totally blessed, as, as uh, you may, may know. Uh, Robin Sanif, who's been our assistant uh, student ministries director, was stepping down at the end of summer. And it just so happened that this summer, uh, Josh met Mikey, who was working up at Hume Lake. Mikey is beginning a seminary at Talbot Seminary 
this week on Wednesday, he starts, and Steve and I are partial to people who are going to Talbot, and uh, so, uh, and it just kind of all worked together that we found someone. Now, there is something I have to let you know first. He is from Kentucky, so I just, I just have to say that, and you're like, what does that mean, Ryan? You put whatever, yeah. It can mean a whole lot of things. <laughs> it can. It can mean a whole lot of things. <laughs> and our, your West Virginia people over there are like, yeah, that's our oh, people come on. right there. Woo-hoo. There you go. Woo-hoo. So, um, plays banjo, all kinds of stuff. So anyway, so. <laughs> Might be true. Might be true. <laughs> so Mikey, starting, uh, starting off with uh, Junior High Ministries here at Seacoast. Tell us just one thing that you're excited about, you're excited to see happen this year uh, in the ministry. Yeah, I think more than anything, this is such an interesting area, quite different from Kentucky. And it's super lost. I know me and Ryan were talking at lunch a few weeks back just about how like only one in 10 people in this area know the Lord and like claim to be a follower of Christ. And so I think that this is just an area that's super just rich for harvest. And so there's a lot of junior hires out there that are just totally lost and looking for purpose and looking for identity. And I'm just excited to just see the kids in the ministry already just go lead out in their communities and reach other people for the Lord. Yeah, that's, that's we're excited about that too. Yeah, I'm, that's what I'm excited about in just a few words. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, we, um, I, we're so excited to have him. He's been a joy to already to meet and have him kind of in, in, embed into the staff within a week. We're like, oh, you just fit, and it's great. And the first time he ever went to San Diego was when he drove down for his interview a few weeks ago. It was like, oh, this is what San Diego looks like. So he's, he's brand new to this, and he's like, oh, it's so much like Kentucky, Tennessee. So anyway. It's the exact same. Y'all should go out and visit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, but so we're, we're so glad to have you with us. And um, what is uh, something that we can be praying for you about? And yeah, you, you can smile because I'm queuing it up because it's one thing we're looking at. Yeah, he's at. just softball. <laughs> so yeah, I'm totally new to the area. I have a, f- a family friend that I'm getting to stay with in Carlsbad. Awesome, awesome people. But I do not have a place to live right now. Technically, they hired a homeless guy. So <laughs> y'all get on to Ryan for that. That's on him. He's the one who kind of headed that up. But if you have any leads or if you have any opportunities that you could fill me in on, come and reach out. Let me know. Also, I'd love to meet you guys. But yeah, be praying for me that I can just find a place to just kind of call my own and make home here while I'm getting to serve with the church. But yeah, that'd be awesome. It'd be great. Yeah, so we're, we're definitely praying that the Lord would open the door, whether it's a roommate situation, an ADU, or a room to rent. So if you know of someone in your neighborhood, you hear of it, um, we'd, we'd love to, you know, be the church and, and help make that happen for him as he comes to this area, because we want him here. So um, would you join me as we pray for Mikey? God, we thank you so much uh, just for your blessings. I thank you that uh, through your hand, you just connected us with this guy who has a love for you and a passion uh, to know you and to help others know you and uh, a heart for ministry, and Lord, he's on that path already, and has been doing it, and you just placed him in our hands. So we thank you for him, and we ask that you'd provide all of his needs. We know that you can, and that you will, and uh, we just ask that you would open those doors. And so thank you for him now. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, and Mike is going to do our scripture reading for the day. I'm indeed. Sweet. So we'll be out of Ephesians chapter 4. This is going to be verses 11 through 16. The Word of God says this, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Well, I don't really know if I'm supposed to pray into something else or just invite Steve up. 
I'm going to pray, and I guess Steve's going to come and preach the word of God to you guys. Lord, I thank you so much just for an opportunity to be here and gather together just as an entire church body um, and just worship your name. God, you are so worthy to be praised. God, you're, you're worthy of every ounce of adoration and worship we could ever bring. Lord, I, I pray over Steve as he just preaches your word that you would just use him as a conduit of your truth. That, Father, this morning, just everything that he says that's from you would just stick in our hearts. And God, if he says anything that's not from you, that you would just cast it away from our minds. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you for the opportunity to just do fellowship, just to get to know one another and eat together and break bread and just partake in the, the Lord's Supper in, in a little bit, God. I just thank you for those things. I thank you for the beauty of your church. Um, it's all for your glory and all in the name of your son that we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Gosh, how do you follow that dude? That's a little bit of energy right there, isn't it? Yeah. Do you, do you not love that that's the new junior high director right there? Can we give him? Come on! Answer to prayer. So grateful to have uh, had a, a little over a year with uh, Robin as part of our student ministries team and her amazing contribution to student ministries and then this hand in glove kind of little thing that just transitioned here with Mikey. It's an absolute blast to be a part of that in, in there as well. So we are in Ephesians chapter four and if that kind of resonates with you and you remember that, we've, it's because we've been a part of an extended conversation where we've been asking this question, what's your move? And really we're doing that from this audacious perspective that, that God has called us to something. He's called us into relationship with himself. That's probably why you're here. You know plenty about that. And he's called us into mission with him. He's called us to, to, to be a part of what it is that he's done in and through Jesus, but he didn't just stop there. He said also, and I want you to go somewhere, and I want you to bear my image, and I want you to reflect that image that you bear because of Jesus into the wider world. And as we begin that conversation, we remember something that Ryan said a few weeks ago. There's a certain audacity to that. There's a certain audacity that we just put out there that the New Testament says we didn't make it up. We didn't come up with this. It's not a great con kind of construct. It's not a, hey, be all you can be. There's an audacity to the New Testament that says that people who bow the knee to Jesus, that invite him into his life, that put their trust in him, not only receive all of the benefits of his death and resurrection, forgiveness and new life, but actually begin to be come like him begin to reflect his actual character begin to be changed from the inside out begin to be transformed morphed is the word metamorphosis actually is the is the word in the new testament to reflect him into the wider world and so we join him in his mission to reflect him and to be like him in all of the different places including as Mikey just pointed out places like our neighborhoods right now where the majority of the people that we run with at the grocery store or who are mad at a stoplight or wherever it is that they are in our neighborhood perhaps don't yet know him. And so into all of that audacity, we kind of put a, a bow around it th this morning because we want to talk a little bit about that invitation into relationship and not just in that invitation into relationship, but that in invitation then into joining his mission. Now, I want to stop there for a second because I fear in two minutes in right here that I'm going to lose a bunch of you. Uh, and, and here's where the lose, uh, I, I don't want to lose you. The audacity to think that that, that transformation, that, that that character, that that putting on of Jesus isn't just for people in general, it's for you. It's for the people that you just shook hands with that are part of another service. It's for the people that you run with and sit next to you and kind of are a part of that. All the people who have placed their trust in Jesus, it's for you too. And it's not just for you in terms of being changed by Jesus, but it's also for you in terms of being used by Jesus, being, being, being transformed by Jesus to be a part of what it is that he is doing. In other words, that you and I, the people that we are rubbing shoulders with, the terribly human, wonderfully beautiful kaleidoscope that is Seacoast Community Church is full of people 
that God wants to use to change the world. Straight up, to change the world, to bring his kingdom to bear on earth, on planet earth right now. And so I don't want to lose you in that because it's audacious. It's easy to think about that for somebody else, but sometimes that person that looks back into the mirror, we just kind of wonder about, right? Like, really? Here we go. But in all of that, we want to continue this conversation about what is your move or what's your move by, by ending with this rich section in Ephesians chapter 4 where Paul, the Apostle Paul talks about becoming an adult, becoming a grown-up. Maybe you heard that in the language of this, and it's an interesting kind of way to phrase it, right? That, that he invites us into this relationship with God in which we don't just simply begin and remain as babies or children, but we actually move on to maturity to full-on, full-blown adulthood reflecting the character of Jesus. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Like, what does it take? What does it look like to move into that adulthood? And we're going to move into this, as, as, move into that in terms of what it means for us, not just individually, but as a community as well. Okay, so, well, let, let's start, let, let's start with, with this thought this morning that, that that this growth or, or this growing up or be maturity m- moving into maturity is grounded in what Jesus has already done so if we have that slide we'll just put that up up there that this is grounded in what Jesus has already done this this is this is the premise that we want to begin. It's why I don't want to lose you right in the outset, that this is not about something that we are going to move into or achieve or to aspire to, but actually just the opposite, that because of what Jesus has done, this maturity that he invites us into, this building up in love is something that he actually can do through normal people. Now, in order to do this, I want to go really, really, really big picture of the story of the Bible very briefly to get us to the place where we begin to see, wow, this is what God is doing in and through people on on planet Earth. Many of you know the story and the trajectory of the Bible very, very well. Let's just be, well, let's begin at the beginning. In Genesis chapter one, chapters one and two, God creates the world, his pronouncement at the back end of all that he's created. It is a good, 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 very good. He loves it. He, he, he loves what he has done. It is exactly what he wanted done. And included and embedded in that creation of the world, in that very good, are human beings. And God has created those first human beings so that they would be fruitful and multiply to fill the earth and subdue it and to reign as his vice regents on planted earth, planet earth okay so they were going to they are going to reign under god on the earth, on the planet that god created for them and all the other stuff Genesis chapter 3, the train wreck, human rebellion, I want something different, we all would have done the same thing that Adam and Eve did, so it's no judgment on Adam and Eve, we, would have, we joined them in that. So that sets the trajectory now for all, well, this is the way that Paul phrases it in, in, in Romans chapter 5, that, death enter, that sin entered the world and death through sin. So all of the aspects of death that you and I experience began in that, including eternal separation from God, began because of our forefathers and foremothers in Adam and Eve. And that sets the world's trajectory because sin and death have entered the world, and so God moves, and he moves through a people. He raises up a man named Abraham, blesses, he, blesses him. He, is, he is, has a son. Through that son, now he launches into a people for his own possession. And in that people for his own possession, the Jewish people, what we also begin to see then is the people who are supposed to be a part of the solution are actually a part of the problem. Hmm. And so God chooses to do something new. Now, he always knew, but he chooses to do something new. And he chooses to say that there will come a day when the rebellion that my people have even experienced now will be changed from the inside out. That I will give them a new disposition and a new inclination toward me, and I will begin this grand journey of changing them from the inside out, morphing them. 
okay? And we see this incredible picture in Jeremiah chapter 31, verses, 30, verses 33 and 34. This is, do we have it up there? Do we, okay, so I'm going to read it. If you, have, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me. Isaiah, if you can find Isaiah, then you keep going, and you can find Jeremiah. And if you can find Jeremiah, find chapter 33. And if you need to check email while I get there, that's fine too. Okay, here we go. Jeremiah chapter 1, t- chapter 31, verses 33 and 34. Here we go. Okay, I'm just going to read those two verses. Jeremiah says this, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one re- teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, for the, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. That God, through the prophet Jeremiah, speaks of a day in which his people will receive a new heart. And that heart will be disposed and inclined toward God. It will move toward him because what God sees in the human project and in all of his people is that the change has to come not from the outside in, but from the inside out. And so that new covenant is what we're going to celebrate later today. That God in and through Jesus has invited us into this new covenant. And part of that new covenant is that we receive forgiveness. And part of that new covenant is that we receive a new heart. Ezekiel chimes in on this and he says that I will exchange their hearts of stone for a heart of flesh that is tender toward me and responsive toward me. And into this grand and incredible way up here project, you and I now experience the forgiveness and the power of Jesus because of what it is that he's done see it was through Jesus that this forgiveness of sins was granted to us and so we bow the knee to him but it wasn't just simply that that Jesus forgave our sins that Jesus Romans chapter 6 tells us that Jesus on the cross broke the power of sin so that you and I can actually move toward God and have hearts inclined to him. And and, and Colossians chapter three tells us that we are to put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. How come? Because we have it. God has given us this new heart through the new covenant so that we can actually be changed from the inside out. I don't know about you, but I kind of need to take a breath after all of that in this incredible overarching place in which we find ourselves, the the part of the story in which we find ourselves. We find that through Jesus and his blood and the blood that he shed on the cross that our our forgiveness was granted to us as we if we if and when we believe in him and we find that he has broken the power of sin and we find that he has given us a new heart and all of this now inclines us to be able to be before him and to receive not only his forgiveness for us but actually to be grounded in moving toward maturity. In other words, we have to set set the foundation for something that is this audacious. It's actually possible for normal human beings to take on the character of Jesus because of what it is that he has done in our lives. Here we are in the story. Here we are in that place where because of what it is that Jesus has done for us, we, we, we can become like him. We can be grounded in him. So, 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 so all of this growth and growing up in our relationship with him and moving toward maturity is based and grounded and founded and rooted upon what it is that he has done for us. Okay, great. Now, so what in the world do we mean then when we talk about what what the ark is or what it looks like to begin to grow up into this. Yes, I understand that Jesus has done a lot for me. Great. But the apostle Paul kind of walked us through a passage in a section here that, well, is, is incredibly layered about what it looks like to be in to, to walk and to move into this maturity. And so just two thoughts here, you guys. Uh, here's the first one. That, that growing up requires our full participation. Okay, that's kind of not 
surprising, but it's something I think sometimes that we actually need to say. The, the, the growing up requires our, our full part participation. Now, this is true for all growing up, is it not? I mean, just think about the maturity process. I, some of you have been so patient with me as I've shown you week after week and month after month pictures of our granddaughter. You've been so cool to indulge and just nod and smile in that Jesus-y kind of way, like, wow, really, again? Hey, bro, she didn't really change much from last week, okay? Oh, look at her, though, look, yeah. And, and so in that, right, you see just the, the, the tenderness and the darlingness of this one who's going to be a year old in just a couple of weeks. Now, don't blink, right? Uh, and so anyway, she's absolutely adult, but she has morphed a whole bunch and she has morphed a whole bunch because someone gave attention to her morphing to her changing so see in that growing up requires our full participation it requires our engagement it requires us participating in every dimension of life okay now she's not even one year old or whatever she's just kind of showing up for the ride and someone else but for all the rest of us as we move into maturity in any kind of way it involves our full participation doesn't it i've thought about this a whole bunch i'm one of i'm like many of you i'm kind of an olympics geek anybody else an olympics geek a few of you yeah you kind of watch so there are certain sports i watch everything and then others i i really don't get but that's a, separate, that's a separate conversation. And so um, I, I was thinking about the maturity process because sometimes I think that when we talk about maturity, um, we miss maybe some other elements of it that I think are fascinating. So here, here's two, I wanna, two that were fascinating to me at the Paris Olympics. One, one was how the different kinds of athletes and how we use terminology like they are at the peak of their powers, right? And so pick your favorite sport at the Olympics and you watch them and there's probably a certain kind of age window that is the perfect age window for them to be elite at their sport, right? Can you kind of picture that in your head? And so they are at the peak of their powers. Now, at the peak of their powers, there's a certain athleticism, right, in whatever it is that they are doing that they have to be at. But there's also a maturity to be able to handle the pressure of the Olympics, right? Like it's a, it's a different thing to be at your athletic peak than actually perform in those 10 or sub 10 seconds or whatever in 100 meters or pick your event, right? There's a maturity that comes with that. Now, here's another one that kind of really struck me as well when I thought about, okay, people that are at the peak of their powers in maturity and what that looks like. It was Mike Tirico who hosted the games. And you're kind of like, ah, that's kind of weird, right? But he's just a pro's pro. Like every time the guy opens his mouth, he's just a pro's pro. He's so comfortable in his own skin, so comfortable with other people. I don't really know what to think quite about Snoop Dogg yet in that kind of capacity, but Mike Tirico is a pro's pro. Now, two different age things, Mike, Tariko is well past whatever athletic prime that he had. I don't know if he was really an athlete or not. I don't know his story very well enough. But he's at the peak of his powers as the host of the Olympics. And those athletes, similar kind of thing, and all the maturities that they, they need. Both of those people, whether it's Mike Tariko or your favorite athlete, here's the thing we would, not, we would never say about them. Well, they just phoned it in. They just showed up. They're just talented. There isn't a single athlete that you just think, well, they're just talented. And NBC tells the story over and over and over again about what they did with their talent, right? How come? Because growing and being at the peak of your powers demands your full participation, right? It does. Okay, now we're not Olympic athletes and we're not Mike Tirico at the peak of his powers. But that basic premise about moving toward maturity factors in for all of us. That we get to fully and actively participate in what's going on. Why kind of make the point of this? Where, where, where are we going with this? Sometimes <laughs> it's possible 
in our spiritual journey to not fully participate. Right? It is for me. Sometimes I, I've, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure I can, should confess all these things, but I'll just confess a few. So sometimes I've been in worship services and not worshiped. You? You? No hands. Yeah. I, I've been anywhere else. And, and probably not doing super weird stuff, but I've been in worship services where I've been working on a to-do list. I've been in worship services where I'm working on a talk that I'm giving while someone else is preaching. I've been in worship services where I can't really sing the songs. I'm like, I'm not feeling it. I've been in worship services where I haven't worshiped. I've been in prayer meetings where I haven't prayed. Bible studies where I haven't really studied or contributed. I mean, this is like, this is kind of my little world here, right? And I've been all of those things. I don't wear it as a badge of honor. I'm just saying it's possible to show up and to not fully participate. To, to be a part of activities but not really be engaged. The Bible uses language like <clears throat> their heart was far from me. And so sometimes I think in all of that, we want to acknowledge that our hearts can be far from and so we want to build the case then for the fact that it requires our full participation, as does a maturity in any other dimension of life. I was laughing with Debbie as we were talking about this just <laughs> the other day, that, you know, it, go, going, being a part of an activity doesn't, I, I want to be careful with this. This is what I was actually thinking. No one can work out for me when I go to the gym, Right? You can't just show up at the gym and have a gym membership and pay lots of money and even have a personal trainer and have them teach you how to do certain exercises that are supposed to benefit whatever ailments or things that you're trying to fix or whatever look you're trying to get. No part of that will ever lift the weight for you. Amen? It just it doesn't work. We can't pay somebody to diet for us. We can't pay somebody to exercise for us. So God has built into the world in which we now live the fact that he has not on purpose removed the struggle. He's actually redeemed the struggle. It takes process and engagement and participation. And this is the way that he's built the world. And he invites us to walk in all of that. So growing and growing up and growing to maturity requires our full participation. It does like an Olympic athlete. It does like Mike Tirico. It does like people who go to the gym. It, go, it, does, it does. It requires our full participation. And sometimes we just need to say that out loud to remove a thought that can come to us in different ways. And it goes, it's magical thinking. It goes like this, that I'm just a passive recipient of what it is that God has done. And so he's magically just going to do something because, and then I have an answer for that. It's not the way that it works. Paul, Paul, said, Paul described kind of his work and work ethic when it came to ministry in some really kind of earthy ways. Colossians 1, back into one, uh, chapter 1, for example, he says, and we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we might present every man complete or perfect or full or mature in Christ. And for this purpose, he says, I listen to the earthiness of this language, I labor and strive, striving according to the power of God which works mightily within me. One of the words that he uses in there is agonizo, agony. I just work really hard at this, yet not I, but the power of Christ, which works mightily within me. So we say to one another, it's okay to like really apply ourselves, to, to make our move and to say we're, we're in and we want to move toward you, Lord. 
that we are yours. And by, because, of, because of the new covenant, because of what you have done, because of the forgiveness and the broken power and the new heart that you have granted to us, that we can actually become and participate with you in what it is that you are doing. And there's another aspect here as well that I, I just want to mention that Paul mentions in the, in the passage. And that is that growing up requires our our full participation, but it also requires, growing up that is, requires the full participation of one another. You you see this in in the back end here of of this section in in Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 15 says, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, That's the Christ-likeness that we're talking about. From whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the whole body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Okay, one of the reasons I mentioned to Ryan that I chose this passage uh, this week is because it is layered and it is complex. And that seems to be my life so, so often. As I think about the journey and kind of walking through, Paul mixes metaphors. He loves, to be able, he loves to do that. He does that all over the place here. And in all this layering, what he seems to say is, is this, that, that growing up requires the full participation, not just of our, ourselves, but also of other people. This makes sense, Right? but there's also a dignity to it that we want to elaborate. Here's the make sense part. That you and I grew up because other people helped us grow up. Would you agree with that? Like, that's the way that it is. Think about our granddaughter, right? Our granddaughter grew up because she has parents that love and care about her and are helping her because no infant can feed themselves, right? You kind of get the trajectory? And so in that tutelage and in that intentionality of parents, and then as that circle continues to expand, we grow up. So, so think about the, the people, for example, that, that, that came alongside you and were helpful to you in helping you grow up at different junctions in your journey beyond your parents. You maybe had a coach. You maybe had a teacher. You maybe had another parent who believed in you and cared about you. You may have had one of those homes in which people were invited in and your parents and family system cared about other, other people. But there's some one another that began to contribute to you growing up. Think about your career. Now, you, you probably didn't come out of undergrad or graduate school or wherever you, whenever you launched your career. You probably did not come into what it is that you're doing with all the answers. Can I get an amen from somebody on that? I'll tell you, that, that's, not, that's not what you emerge with, Mikey. Are you here, bro? Where are you? Yeah. That's not where you're going to get from Talbot School of Theology, and I love Talbot School of Theology. But you don't get all the answers. In fact, in some sense or whatever, you get more questions. But you don't get everything, but you get enough to get hired, right? And then people come around you, one another's come around you to help you become the kind of person that can thrive at your job, right? And so they tutor you or they mentor you or you have kind of some kind of development or professional training or whatever it is, but someone helps you mature. Someone helps us grow up and grow into maturity. And the same thing's true in spades in the body of Christ. That this is the way that God has wired the world. So the people who are far away from God and far away from each other come together in relationship before Almighty God, drawing from his power, are changed from the inside out so that they become like Jesus and want to give their life away to other people. They want to. They think about other people and they get joy. And it's like, I want to give, I want to pour into you. I want to care about you. I want to help you. I want to serve you. I want to minister to you. I want to be in fellowship with you. I want to, I want to, I want to. And wait for it. I want to serve you pulled pork on Labor Day weekend. And on it goes, right? 
that this transformational journey that happens through one another creates this beautiful kaleidoscope of the body of Christ building itself up in love. So when we talk about what's your move, we're not talking about what's your move because, hey, I don't know, we want to generate activity or even more cynical than that. Hey, we need stuff done and we need people to do it. Nah, right? Like, we, we get those asks all the time, right? Everything your kids do needs people, men and women hours, right? I mean, on and on and on. But what we talk about here is that opportunity to grow together and to build the body up in love. Now, here's where I want to pause here for a second. This is an extraordinary thing that God has invited us into. It's maybe not quite as audacious as becoming like Jesus, but I don't know, you can see it from there. Because what God, the dignity that God has given to his people is to participate in his mission. And it's we, as we participate with one another, that build up the body of Christ in love. In other words, we have a place in that, in God's grand scheme. Now, Ryan has said this a number of different times, and I'm just going to say it again. It's a woefully inefficient way to do things, (laughs) right? but it's the way that he wants us to be in relationship with him and with one another. So you probably have somebody, in fact, you probably have lots of people that you gather great joy from serving or being a part of or helping. But here's one of the things I think that I found extraordinary about kind of this whole journey and the story. Ryan mentioned a couple of weeks ago out of Ephesians chapter 2 that God has given us works that we should participate in, that, that these works that he has designed before the foundation of the world that we should walk in them. And, and so in those works, we get, to be, we get the privilege of making a contribution to the lives of, of other people. Now, you probably have sensed this, experienced it, and felt it that there are certain times where you have things that you are doing and participating in that you wake up kind of and you realize, maybe I shouldn't tell anybody this, but I'm really having fun. Like, I'm really having fun. Like, when you watch the worship team, they work hard and they have great talent, but they're having fun right? Like they're engaged and they are worshiping. And you just spread that out by a million different kind of ways in the kaleidoscope of what a local church looks like, what our local church looks like. And you see people that way for it are actually experiencing joy in giving, right? Now here's the kicker. The people who are receiving their gift are also experiencing joy, are they not? They're like experiencing. Someone is pouring into me. Someone is caring about our kids right now. Someone is is helping me understand. Someone is leading me in a particular place. And it's like, this is awesome. And so we get the joy that you uniquely get from doing something that you love and no one has to ask you twice, right? You kind of know what you love doing when someone just asked you twice. Hey, would you, I'm in, right? Now, it's not everything that we say yes to that quickly. But there are some things for all of us that it's like, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. And we get the joy of participating and they receive the joy of actually being engaged and growing and all of that. What God invites us into is that that trajectory characterizes our lives as people and as a community, that we get to be the people who are growing up in him and growing up together in him. And what he does through that, the the brilliance of all of that layer and all of that complexity is that the body of Christ is built up in love and it changes the world. That's what we have the privilege of being a part of. So when we talk about making your move and what's your move, it's what's your move toward God and toward one another. 
we started our time together by mentioning this morning something that we know in our bones that we have to say over and over and over again. And that is that all of this is grounded upon what it is that Jesus has done for us. And so I'm gonna invite the worship team up and they're gonna begin here in this journey. And we're gonna transition to a time of the Lord's table. And so in, in that, I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna invite Jim Tkach, one of our elders, to, to lead us in this time of communion. Let's pray together. And so Father, as we come before you to celebrate We thank you for what it is that you have done for us and for the vision that you have of us as individuals and for us as a community, that you see what it is that we could uniquely reflect into your world because of what you've done in and through and for us in Jesus. So now as we come, Jesus, to, to celebrate you, to celebrate the audacity of what you've done, to celebrate the audacity of what you can make normal human beings. We remember you, and we give thanks for what you have done. Thank you, Jesus, for going the whole way for us. Thank you for the audacity of actually becoming like you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Jim, come on up and lead us in this time.